Now, I hope that this week I'm here as your guest will be pleasing to the Lord. I have to answer to God for my ministry here. This, for the evangelist, is the choicest season of the year. And I'm happy for the privilege of being here. And you have to answer to God for your contribution to this week. I find out where I'm here, where I'm here and some things about you. You're not particularly interested in me, but I am you. I find out whether you've got dead organizations or not, whether you have a single organization in this church that isn't geared to get the gospel to men and women. And I want to be a favorable report because God's interested. We must use every means at our disposal to creep up on the blinded minds and eyes and sides of men and women and get the word of life to them. So I challenge every Sunday school teacher, everybody who has a place of leadership I'd hate to be a Sunday school teacher, not have enough influence on my class to get that class out after souls. Amen. Amen. Say, is it against the law to say amen up there? Huh? Oh, no. Well, bless your dear heart. I invite you to turn tonight to the same passage of scripture we used this morning, and I wish to read the last verse of the third chapter, Second Corinthians, the eighteenth verse, and down through the sixth verse of the fourth chapter. I believe that we read in the morning hour, beginning at verse one of chapter four. But tonight I wish to read, beginning at verse 18, down through chapter 4, verse 6. And I wish to use verse 5 of the fourth chapter as a text, that's a good word, for the word of the message tonight. And I read the text first and then read it in the context and the light of the verses above and the one verse below. And the Apostle Paul says in verse 5, For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves, your bondslaves, your servants, your bondslaves, for Jesus' sake. That verse of Scripture divides men and women, or in the 18th verse of the third chapter, we start off with the occupation, what God's people spend most of their time doing. And then when we get the verse to the next chapter, we, we are just amazed as we read what the Holy Spirit has to say about the condition of people. And then in verse 6, we have the testimony of a man who was rescued from his blinded condition and was given the sea the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Our text tonight is the Holy Spirit's only remedy to change blinded men who cannot see the glory of God in Jesus Christ to change in the men and women 
who spend at least some part of every day doing what Paul says all of God's people do, as recorded here in the 18th verse of the third chapter. You can put it down that God's people practice what this verse of Scripture says. But we all, and in those words, but we all, contrasting the old Jewish people who read the Scriptures with blinded eyes and with a veil not on the Scriptures but on their eyes, and thus search the Scriptures every day of our life and rejected the one the Scriptures talk about when he appeared. And in contrast to those people, and they still do it, they read the Scripture with blind eyes and miss the Christ. The Apostle Paul describes that occupation of preoccupation of all of God's people everywhere this is largely how a child of God spends his days and nights. Read it. We all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, something happens to us, are changed into the same image. From glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. If I'm speaking to some couple who lived in the state of matrimony, say, 40, 50 years, that's why they begin to look alike and you think alike. Do you know that? That's the God's truth. And that's the reason there's no such animal as a person who's a Christian that isn't becoming more like Christ day by day. Because if you're a Christian, you've seen the glory of Christ, and one look ruined you. You couldn't possibly go a single day without spending some time, as the old Bible teachers called it, feasting on the blood of your justification and just looking as in a glass with a dim view yet one day it'll be with an undim view for one day we shall see him as he is and when we see him as he is we shall be like him but now, with a dim view, but it's a view, a Christian's a person who's seen the glory of God in Christ, and that look can never leave him, and he spends his days. Don't tell me he doesn't. Paul says all of God people do this. We look with open face, like in a glass. What are you looking at? The glory of the Lord. And what happens? Why people who look often at the glory of the Lord. What happens to them? Somebody read it there. They're what? They're changed into what? The same image from what? From glory to glory. Hallelujah. Well, I've been able to tell, Scriptures just tell us two things about what God's people will do in the glory land. Maybe others, but this is for all I've been able to get, and this is enough. And strangely enough, We'll do in the glory land exactly what we've done down here. The scriptures tell us that God's people, what we call heaven, will serve him and look 
on his face. Oh, boy. If we change just a little bit from day to day as looking through a glass with dim view, with eyes that can see as clearly as they are, if just that dim look at the glory of heaven for the display of whose God, God created this world and has ordained that everything that draws back in God's word shall we down to the glory of God's Son. Boy, and just imagine spend a few billion years in glory, looking with undimmed eyes at the glory of Jesus Christ. Woo! I'm glad you get along just fine, thank you. <laughs> That's a wonderful prospect. But then the scene changes. And in verse 1 of chapter 4, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, what a ministry it is, not doing, but looking. <laughs> we got this ministry, praise the Lord. As we receive mercy, we never lose hope, we think not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, by handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man conscious in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. And here is the most terrible verse of Scripture in all of the Bible. This describes lost people. You know, the most terrible thing about lost people is the devil has blinded their minds that they cannot see and the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ can't shine under them. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, and fixed them, he blinded them, he had to, if he didn't, just preach one gospel sermon in the anointing power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit would take the simple words of the gospel. And men and women would see the glory of Christ. See it? And if you ever see the glory of Christ, you'll be his forever. Thanks be unto God. But men's eyes and minds are blinded by Satan. And he's done it deliberately. Under the permission of Almighty God, that's too deep for me, I know it's so. Men are blind, so they do not see the glory of Christ. Bless the gospel of the glory of Christ. Change your King James Version there, please. It says the glorious gospel. I don't mean much. But it's the gospel of the glory of Christ. The glory of Christ. Watch it. There's a child of God. He spends a lot of his time doing what? The whole of it. The whole of what? The glory of Christ. And as he does it, it gets better 
and good and good. And he himself is changed and changed and changed and changed and changed into the same way. Praise God. The poor lost man doesn't see the glory in Christ. You talk about God reigning from a cross and preach that dead, maltreated, sacrificial God hanging on a glory tree. Lost men don't see the glory of God there. Satan's blinded their minds, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine under them. And then verse 6, our text this morning, a man's feeble attempt to describe what happens when a person gets what we call S-A-V-E-D. Verse 6 says, what a contrast. Verse 4, the devil blinded the people's mind. Bless the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the very image of God, should shine upon them. But Paul said, praise God, something happened. He said, there's a difference between me when I was killing Christians and when I'm preaching to you, something happened. What happened? I made a decision to accept Jesus. No, no. Why? God, who commanded the light to shine in the darkness, has shined in our hearts. What for? What did you turn on the light for, Lord? To give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God where? in the face of Jesus Christ. The difference between a saved man and a lost man simply this. If a man ever gets saved, he'll get saved when Almighty God, as it pleases him, turns the light on, the light of the gospel, and the darkness goes, and that old sinner sees the glory of Christ. Lost man, going on a blinded way. I wish you believe what I'm talking about. Oh, as I go up and down the country, I'd give a nickel and a half to town and cash if I could find a church that knew how to pray. For the work of the Holy Spirit, can dispel the darkness and turn the light of glory into an old sinner's heart. Is this generation going to go to hell unwept over? Unprayed for? Do you folks know how to pray? 
Do you know what intercession is? Huh? I wonder. Or there are just two things that God uses in this matter of the difference between a blinded mind cannot see the glory of Christ and a person who spends a lot of his time beholding the glory of Christ, head over heels in love with the lover of his soul. There are just two things. God uses the foolishness of preaching his son. And God uses the intercession of the saints of God. That's all. That's all. We can talk all we want to, but there's never been any way to improve on God's back. And under God, it is a drop of Christian blood in God's perfection churches today. It must get out of us again that we preach Jesus Christ the Lord, not ourselves, not from prison to pulpit, not empty pocket with good as experiences, but it definitely needs to get out on people who meet together call themselves churches of the living God. Not who preaches there, but who preaches there. And where are the people who sit in the pew and the man who stands behind the sacred desk know what they're talking about when they say, We tell us, we proclaim Jesus Christ the Lord. But the only remedy God's got for the blinded condition of men who cannot see the glory of God, the only God's got to turn the light of the gospel into a man's soul is by the faithful proclamation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 5 says, We preach not ourselves. Ah, uh, my, this is God's will. I can't bear the world on my shoulders. Too big for me. And Paul said, I tell you one thing can do. We can't, we can't unblind people. i tell you what we can do. We can preach Jesus Christ the Lord. We can preach him. And there never has been, and there never will be, any movement of God in unstopping the wax ears of men and women, and opening the blinded minds of men and women, never has been in a way apart from the proclamation of the Lord Jesus Christ. May I say three things right quickly? I seek not your own. It's my best privilege to go from place to place. I've done it many years. But I'm just as much a member of this congregation as I am the one I'm supposed to be a member of Winston-Salem. I've been bought with a price. I'm not my own. I belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. I've been baptized into his precious body. Yes, I have. Yes, I have. Every blood-bought child of God is my brother or sister in the Lord. And I am going up and down the country doing my little best to scream out 
and that the time has come when we must preach the whole gospel once again. And the whole gospel is just to preach the whole Christ. Jesus Christ, God's anointed Lord, into whose hands, in virtue of his death on the cross, Almighty God has given every human being, and to whom God Almighty has promised that everything that breathes for the land of tongues will bring glory to his precious name. The initial confession of the early church was that Jesus Christ is Lord. Romans 10 and 9, this is the word of faith which we preach unto you, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. The early church, the ones nearest the Lord, they went up and down the country and didn't try to have dead level best talk somebody into accepting Jesus as the Savior. They went up and down the country and proclaim that God Almighty had exalted him and had declared him to be Lord over all. And the watchword and the battle cry of the early church that went everywhere and said, Hey, Sue, Jesus is curious and demanded that men and women bow down and come under the rule of the Lord Jesus Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, your churches in America are fixing to go out of business unless there's enough people in them, and men demand the pulpits and teach the Sunday school classes that will come back to preaching Jesus where he is now. He's on a throne. He's on a throne, brother. And if you want to have anything to do with him, you'll have to approach him on the throne. And the subject bows to the sovereign and surrenders his rights and becomes a loyal subject or he's not received. Jesus Christ has been declared by Almighty God to be Lord of all. One of the most damnable things been preached in America just about turned our churches. I hope there isn't company accepted. I don't know you. It just about turned our churches into where they are just nearly as nice as the average Kiwani or Rotary or some kind of club like that. They haven't as much influence as those clubs. And I don't want to do as much good or not. But they've gone all over this country and filled our church rows full of people who think that they, in their wonderful, generous hearts, have made Jesus Christ the absolute Lord of our lives. But I tell you, there's a lot of porn in hell. No man ever has the option or the privilege of 
that in Jesus Christ is here. God gives you to God made him your Lord. And he's your Lord. Whether you're in rebellion or in subjection, you can bow to him. You can recognize him. You can see him on the throne. You can be glad he's exalted. You can rejoice in his rule, or you can buck it. But God Almighty has decreed and declared and ordained that because Jesus Christ poured out his blood, God's made him Lord. Down in our country, we Southern Baptists have to have our, our annual encampments and some of Bible conferences, and I think you have some of them up here. That's to give the unseen church members a chance to walk the aisle one more time and surrender to the Lordship of Christ. They say, way back down, I took him as my Savior, and now I'm going to let him. Well, bless your sweet little heart, I think that's nice of you, to permit the Lord of glory to do something Sure is nice. And the little bit of Tinsuini Christ that you have to permit to do something. Ladies and gentlemen, you better listen to me. Jesus Christ is your ordained Lord. God made him that. The difference between the man who's saved and the man who ain't. The man who's saved is just ticker to death that Jesus is on the throne. And the fellow that's not saved, he wants to push Jesus off so he can run things. He's mad. He's mad. I'm going to tell you right now, my friends, in the early days, they went everywhere and said, If you come, Jesus reigns as Lord by thou. And people didn't do it, lest they meant business. Because to call Jesus Lord for a Jew meant to actually believe that Jesus was God. And the Jew believes that one God, and he lets you pull his tongue out at the roots before he worship anybody except God. And for a Jew to call Jesus, Lord, meant that he had to say goodbye to the synagogue and the temple, and mom and papa, and everybody else. And for a Gentile to call Jesus Lord in the early days meant that if Caesar found it out, for Caesar was a curious, he was Lord. Over in Japan, it's getting back that way. During MacArthur's reign for a little while over there, it was eased somewhat, but before the Second World War, the Emperor of Japan was the God of Japan. And you could believe anything on God's earth you wanted to in Japan, just long as when the time came, you called him your Lord. And a lot of preachers went over from the United States, their Youth for Christ preachers. They about got everybody in Japan converted one night. The Japanese are mighty, mighty courteous. They won't think of refusing you anything. And they went over and said, wouldn't you put, please take Jesus? They said, well, we'd be glad to. And they took him, put him up on the shelf with the rest of their gods. But they kept on worshiping the emperor. A guy sitting in Chicago at a Christian businessmen's meeting, and, and some folks that had been over there, they were criticizing some of the Christians who weren't sent to consecration camps uh, when the Second World War broke out because they compromised a little bit. And when they came to arrest them and demand that they give their worship to the emperor, they crossed the hearts, crossed the fingers, knocked on wood, and wasn't going to do it in the heart, but they would with the head. And this missionary is criticizing. 
He said, no, not to die. And I said, push safe. He said, oh, we had a nice place in Chicago on State Street and Victory Center around the elaborate dinner of Christian Fellowship and talk about what we wouldn't do. We're safe around there. But when they come to you like they did many missionaries and people in Japan and said, it's worship, it's fall down to Hiarita as your Lord, or it's go to a concentration camp, that'd be a white horse for a different color. But brother, when the Apostle Paul said, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, stand up on your hind legs, let this world know it. Here is one person who recognizes Jesus Christ as God's Lord and His Lord. He's in His hands. Stand up! Be counted! Brother, when Paul preached that, if the emperor found it out, it was cursed. And the old Colosseum, you can still go and see where thousands of Christians were fed to the lions because they would not deny Christ and call Caesar Lord. And the battle still goes on, and this world still has its Caesar. And this book still presents Jesus Christ the Lord. And it's still Caesar or Christ. But it's never Christ and Caesar. For so help me, a man cannot help but one word at a time. And the choice is still to be made by men and women now. And the church of Jesus Christ must ring with no uncertain trumpet call and say, Jesus Christ is God's Lord. Bow down to him. You didn't become a member of the New Testament church unless before this world, by your actions, by your manner of living, you said, look at me. He's my Lord. He's my Lord. He's my Lord. In the second place, the only authentic confession of Jesus Christ is his Lordship. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3, you quoted it many times. I believe I'll read it so I'll be sure to get it right. There are two dynamic statements that we need to give heed to often. Verse 3 of chapter 12, 1 Corinthians. Wherefore, he makes two statements. He said, I'm going to tell you something no man can do. I give you to understand that no man, okay, who he is, no man speaking by the Spirit of God Call it Jesus anathema, a curse. Holy Spirit, not in a man, that calls Jesus a curse from God. And then he makes another statement, and that no man can save. No man can save. Not will, brother, but can. No man can say that Jesus is Lord. You can call him Savior till you're blue in the face. But no man ever yet been able to stand up and tell him the truth and say Jesus is Lord, but by the Holy Spirit. This can't be done. Did I, was it too plain to you think I was meddling? When I asked this church, do you know what intercessory prayer is? Don't you tell anybody. 
But down our way, we have to have a Bible study on prayer meeting night. We can't even meet together one night a week just to join hands and hearts. About ten minutes of it, we'd all go crazy. God help us. Don't you know a man can't call Jesus Lord except in the power of the Holy Ghost? That's what's said, no? You know what's said? Anybody can say, yeah, I think Jesus is my Savior if you can cut him up that way. No man can call him Lord. That's what God calls him. Said this same Jesus whom you crucified, God hath raised and made to be both Lord and Messiah. You know what I said? The one thing that will do the right to the Lord, brother, is in the power of the Holy Spirit. Be able to call him Lord and mean it. You know what I mean? Lord. In the 14th chapter of Luke, three different times, my Lord used the expression, cannot. Cannot. If a man doesn't do that, he cannot be my disciple. If a man doesn't do that, he cannot be my disciple. And the third time, if a man doesn't do so and so, he cannot be my disciple. For two hours, we've tried to say that you can be saved and not be a disciple, but it can't be. You can pretend to make a profession, be serious about it. Jesus says, if a man don't be business, don't mean business, he doesn't say he can't be a good disciple, he can't be a disciple at all. I think we'll read it, verse 26 of the 14th chapter of Luke. It's familiar, I trust, but I read it again. My Lord said, If any man come to me, hate not his mother, and his father, and wife, and children, and brothers, and sisters, give his own life, he cannot be my disciple. How to separate the men from the boys? That's what Jesus said. And verse 27, And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot. You can be a lot of other things, but you can't be a disciple of me, said the Lord. And then verse 33, So likewise whosoever he be of you, that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. There's about a million questions I'd like to ask the Lord about those, and I don't expect I could answer them, but I got sense enough to know this, brother. Man, if you don't mean business about this business, if this isn't wholehearted, you just well forget this saved business. You can't be any kind of a disciple unless it's all out. And it goes against the grain to surrender yourself and your family and your money and everything about it to the Lord Jesus Christ and just be a good steward, just a good handler. 
or something he owns. You ain't going to do that, bud, without the Holy Spirit. You know that? You're not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. Don't tell me. I cut out the same cloth you are. I'm a member of Adam's run for and race. Give me a nice little free ticket to heaven. Don't have to follow Jesus. Don't love him nothing else. Let me talk about how much money I give and how much money I do and about all I do. All I do. Sure. But come around and let the Lord say, Bud, it's all or nothing. It's all or nothing. I'll be ahead of your papa and your mother and your brothers and sisters. I'll be first. I won't play. And as a kid, we played choose them up, you know, one-eyed cat, I think we called it. And the boy had the ball, he was the hero, and the fellow had the bat, he was second in command. And we'd choose sides. See, who's back first? And the fellow had the bat, he didn't get the bat first, he owned it, he'd take his bat and go home. The Lord said, you won't play with me, I'm going back first. Amen. He got a right to do it. Nobody else has. Ladies and gentlemen, went out from the church doors one more time, walked men and women with a mark of discipleship to the rule of him whose right it is to reign. That'll be a glorious day. A glorious day. And then there's the last thing. The only remedy to change blind men and the men who see the glory of Christ. This don't work. Just nothing will. Just keep on proclaiming the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the only way into his body into his salvation. It's the only authentic confession. Jesus is Lord. God made him Lord. I sure am glad he did. I bow at his shrine, my Savior divine, my wonderful, wonderful Lord. But thank God there's one last word. The confession of the Lordship of him who bought this world with his precious blood. That'll be the ultimate confession of all mankind. You know, I like people to agree with me. Don't you kind of like people to agree with you? I've been going up down this country, and not everybody agrees with me, but one day, every human being going to say, Old Rock Barn is right. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. I've been telling this generation of people, they say, Preacher, I trust in my Savior, and I go up and down the country, and, and people say, well, I never heard about him being Lord. Well, I said, been in the book all time. And, and God says he's Lord. And God says that he's turned everybody over to him. And God says, that as your Lord, he'll be your Savior or your judge. So you're going to be one of them. And the book says that one day everybody is going to stand up and confess that Jesus Christ 
is the Lord, the Lord. Everybody going to do them <laughs> one of these days. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself, made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made of the...